In business news this week, three things to know. First, jobs, jobs, and more jobs. Party like it's 1999. The November jobs report blows past expectations, adding 321,000 jobs last month on track to be the strongest job creation in 25 years. Then, it's the invasion of the hackers. Another major retailer suffers a data breach. When will it end? And whistleblower windfall. Why the Securities and Exchange Commission says tips and payouts have reached record levels. Rise Exchange starts now. Hello, I'm Gary Anthony Ramsey, in for the traveling Andrew Schmertz, who's on his way back from toasty Miami, Florida, to a frigid New York, so I don't exactly blame him for taking his time. Anyway, on to business. It's a Friday to remember. Economists say after the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported the strongest payroll additions in more than two years, although a large portion of the job gains were temporary and part-time jobs, the gains were broad-based and large factors suggesting long-term future strength in the market. Employers added 321,000 jobs in November, a number far greater than the 230,000 that was expected. And the unemployment rate remains steady at 5.8%. That's still at its lowest level since the recession. In some other key economic data, U.S. manufacturing slowed for the third straight month. The U.S. Department of Commerce says factory orders dropped 0.7% in October. But the U.S. market sizzled today on the aforementioned promising jobs report with the Dow and S&P 500 hitting new records on the news. Green all across the board. Let's take a look at the numbers. The Dow closing up to 17,958. The S&P 500 closing at 2,075. And the Nasdaq ended the day at 4,780. And here's how the markets did over the week. The Dow closed up 128 points for the week. The S&P 500 was up 0.38% and the Nasdaq down 23%. The top stocks we're watching here at Exchange. Analysts downgraded Google shares from buy to neutral after regulatory risk and competition from Facebook have lowered the company's outlook. Google closing down at $528.08. Well, the Gap says sales have hit a three-month decline after its new ads failed to impress new customers. The Gap closing up at $40.74. General Motors says that it's closing the flagship plant in Germany for its Opel line of vehicles. The factory is being shut down as the struggling subsidiary is restructured. General Motors closing up $33.93. Now for a look at commodities, gold closing, um, closing at $11.92, 10 cents an ounce, and oil closing at $67.71 per barrel. Bent crude prices are also below $70 a barrel for the first time since 2010. Well, for more on the Promising Jobs Report and what we can expect going forward is the author of The Money Compass, Where Your Money Went and How to Get It Back, CEO of Grimaldi Economics, Mark Anthony Grimaldi joins us here in exchange. I got to tell you that uh, I'm the senior franchise on the middle Anthony name here in the building, <laughs> but uh, welcome to Arise. Thank you. Tell us about this numbers report. Is it, uh, none of it is buried in the temporary jobs, part-time jobs. Is it as good news as people like to say that it is, that the government would like you to believe? Gary Anthony, I'm here to tell you that it's not bad news. Uh -huh. 321,000 Americans got a new job in the month of November. That's very good news. The average hour worked was the same, so that's very good news. Uh, the economy is growing at a clip that is about three, three and a half percent. That's very good news. However, as an economist, like we've spoken in the past, every time there's good news, there's bad news. What are you getting? What are you giving up? So the economy did gain 320,000 new employees, and that's fantastic. It also pulled in 44,000 from the last two months before that. So that's also fantastic. But what does this mean for the macro economy as we end the year? And what does it mean for 2015? That's what everybody wants to know. Now, in terms of these jobs that have been gained, they are low-wage jobs and part-time jobs that we've talked about. Um, does the, the amount of money these new jobs that are getting, which is minimal or minimal to sub-minimal, um, how is that going to affect, will it be able to help these families, American families, sort of 
kick it back to the economy in terms of spending and... and... You must read my newsletters, <laughs> because in mid-2009, I wrote an article, and what I said was, this recovery is what's going to happen, is we're going to replace millions of high-paying jobs with millions of low-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. And this is what I said in 2009, and that's exactly what happened. The problem we have is the jobs that are being created now can support the average household. Two individuals working 40 hours a week, both of them making the median income, can afford the average mortgage in this country. However, here's the bad news. With interest rates this low, the big problem that everyone has and the big question I get asked about all the time is, is this going to affect them raising rates going into 2015? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Interest rates will normalize. The law of economics will always go back to its normal. So if we get a 10-year note that goes from 2.3 now to 4, which will bring mortgages to 6, uh, there's good and bad. Who is this good for and who is this bad for? Th today's news is absolutely fantastic for senior citizens. The interest rate that they're going to get on our bank accounts is going to go up in 2015. The interest that they're going to get on their CDs are going to go up, which the senior citizens have paid for the Great Recession as much as any group there is, and nobody talks about that. Who is this also good for? If you're looking to buy a house, this is going to have an initial pump into houses because people know interest rates are going to go up next year. So they're going to rush to lock in those rates now. Mm -hmm. there's, now, there's talk, even though there's less of a threat of it now with a full Republican Congress, of raising the minimum wage. What kind of effect will that have on future job growth? Well, I'm on record of being in favor of raising the minimum wage. You know, we need to get that to a livable wage. Maybe we need to cut down some of the benefits. Because right now, Anthony, Gary Anthony, there's no way to jump. Mm -hmm. I know I'm fixed on Anthony. That's yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. That, yeah, that's but there's no way to jump. If, if, you, if, you're sitting, if you're making this sitting home and you're making this working, nobody's going to do it. So we need to raise the minimum wage. Because if you did, if you did the math, like I said, $15 minimum wage, mm -hmm. two individuals working 40 hours a week can afford the average house. Yeah. Mark Anthony Grimaldi of Grimaldi Economics, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And I hope to have you back and talk more about what the job growth will look like in 2015. Be happy to. Coming up, hack attacks becoming all too common in the country. What's being done to stop the invasion of cybercrime? You're watching Arise Exchange. Unrest continues in Ferguson, Missouri. Exactly what happened to Michael Brown Jr.'s memorial. The NFL fallout continues. Why does this video change the game? President Barack Obama met with congressional leaders today. He does not need congressional approval to carry out the strikes. The only language understood by killers like this is the language of force. Do I want to have a draft? No, because I don't want to have war. Hello and welcome to Arise America. I'm Debbie Turner Bell. Informative. The U.S. economy is on the right path, and the wizard of the Fed is leading the way. We started our companies originally to create something that made a positive difference. Compelling. I became very successful. Not allowing myself to be average. Our favorite person of the day, when we pick one person who grabbed our attention, and not for the right reason. Yeah, he sort of lost All it. business. Investors came back from the long weekend, tanned, rested, and ready to buy stocks. Entertaining Money Daily, Arise Exchange. Welcome back to Arise Exchange. While it seems that every day now we're hearing about a new data breach of one kind or another, and unfortunately, it seems the hackers are winning, always seeming to be one leg up on the authorities. In the latest hack attack, the popular retailer Bebe confirming that a security breach at its stores over the shopping holiday period in November, hackers stole customer names, account numbers, expiration dates, and verification codes from cards that were swiped in stores. Cybersecurity expert and Berkeley Veritronics CEO Scott Schober joins us now with more. Scott, once on this show, I think it was you, use an analogy. It's like it's, it, if you have one bungling burglar in your house, that's one thing. But if you have a thousand, they're eventually going to get it. I mean, now it seems like it's tens yeah. of thousands. Is it really growing by that kind of a rate? Oh, yeah. It's exponential. It's scary, actually, when we think about it. And it doesn't stop, right? It seems like week after week after week, these breaches keep happening. So there's certainly some concern there. And it's one retailer after the next. Moving forward now, what is that? What kind of pressure does it put on these companies to to shore up their walls? Yeah, well, the monitoring is just not there because if you notice in all of these breaches, be it Target, Home Depot, and we go back and a list of these, it always comes out after the fact. The the retailer is not 
coming forward and saying, hey, we were breached. It's usually weeks or months afterward. In the same case here, it was really reported on by, by Brian Krebs, mm -hmm. another security expert, that, that found this out because all the banks were complaining of all this fraudulent activity on the credit card. Then the company comes out and admits, yes, we've been breached here. Mm -hmm. Add to that the specter of what's being described as state-sponsored hacking in the, from the Chinese and now allegedly the North Koreans? Yeah, there's, there's talk with North Koreans with, with regards to the Sony, and it's kind of an interesting twist. I think maybe it's more of a media spin perhaps with the, the movie coming out, the interview, uh, where they're targeting the, the North Korean leader, and, and of course they're denying it. There's no real proof yet. I, I speculate more likely it's probably an insider that divulge the information or compromise it because when you really dig down deep into it there was usernames passwords but more importantly the critical infrastructure the servers inside of Sony that's what was compromised so to have that level of access it's pretty tough to do from, from North Korea but possible now what kind of money are we talking about in terms of what the companies are spending a that have been breached and then B companies that have are trying to prevent it yeah that's that's a beautiful uh, point there if you think about it from the Sony standpoint, we don't know what the damage really is there. Uh, certainly they spend a significant amount of money on, on security, on monitoring, things of that nature. It's the outcomes after the breach that really has got everybody's antennas up because what could happen? Obviously the lawsuits, discrimination because there was not just social security numbers released but confidential information, salaries uh, of even celebrities, Sylvester Stallone and, and others of the like. You wouldn't want to get him upset, right? This comes at a time when the consumers are, are trying to, are actually stepping up their cyber spending. Yeah. And so, I mean, you've, you've, come, you've come on before, you've, you've told us about tips now, time and time again. I mean, what, what, is the, what is the takeaway from this increasing number of breaches? Yeah, well, well, spending in the proper area, really what they need to do is not post-breach, and that's what most of these are doing, to put out the fires afterward and calm uh, really shareholders down. What they need to do is actively monitoring, do web crawling, see if there's actually breaches that are going to happen, where the, the cards, the credit card information is in the underground, it's about to be sold. We need to stop it right then. And there's applications and software out there to actively do that and prevent it before it gets out there on the market and sold to the masses. And that's what they're slowly starting to do, spending in the proper areas of software. In terms of the companies that have already been breached and, and breached big, you know, give me a number. What's the, what's the top dollar that's been spent in order to um, you know, make customers whole? Well, we'll look at uh, probably, probably the biggest case is J.P. Morgan. They went from saying they're spending about $100 million, now upwards of $250 million just to combat future cybersecurity threats. So that's a tremendous amount of money that they're spending there. Scott Schober, always a pleasure and always informative. Change. Time for stories making headlines across the nation and the world. President Obama nominates Ashton Carter as the next defense secretary. Carter, a physicist and high-tech weapons expert, served as deputy defense secretary from 2011 to 2013. Uh, if confirmed, he would replace Chuck Hagel, who resigned under pressure last month after just two years on the job. And if confirmed by the Senate, Carter would become President Obama's fourth defense secretary in less than six years. Well, Apple routinely deleted music million iPad users. The suit claims that Apple abused its monopoly power in the music industry to push out competition by erasing songs from iTunes rivals on their customers' iPods. Apple claims that the measures were taken to protect its contracts with record labels. And speaking of J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan holds on to its ranking as the top performing investment bank this year. The data compiled by the firm Coalition uh, shows that, showed that U.S. banks dominated the top spots in the world, with Goldman Sachs coming in second. Deutsche Bank shared third place with Citigroup and Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Well, billionaire Richard Branson is planning to shake up the cruise industry. Branson announced that his company is extending its travel empire to soon include Virgin Cruises. This would be the first new cruise business since Disney Cruise Lines was launched in 1996. Virgin Cruises will be based in Florida, but no word yet on when the company expects to launch its operations. And a blast from the past. Vinyl records have been making a comeback in a big way. Sales of vinyls jumped 40% in the first six months of the year, a rate that was just barely outpaced by music downloads. The recent resurgence in vinyl sales has been largely attributed to independent rock fans and nostalgia buffs. While the Securities and Exchange Commission received more than 3,500 tips from whistleblowers in 2014, 
the largest number received since the whistleblower program went into effect three years ago. Now, Congress set up an SEC award fund with $400 million for whistleblowers. The hope was that it would, uh, that by increasing the rewards, individuals in the industry would have more of an incentive to come forward if they saw wrong being taken place and blow the whistle. Well, the whistle keeps blowing. Robert Sadowski, partner at Sadowski Fisher, specializes in whistleblower cases. He joins us now with more details. Now, it's clear that money is a main motivator in this, but what would you say the secondary factor is for coming forward? Is it clearing a conscience? Well, whistleblowers tend to be a little different type of people. They're not necessarily the team player. Uh, they have a moral compass that they hear. They march to a different drummer. They see the wrong and they want it corrected. Uh, they also see the importance to the industry and in that uh, industry needs to be transparent. And without whistleblowers coming forward, uh, it would be next to impossible for the SEC to uh, bring as many enforcement actions as it does. Now, we should point out that this is a separate whistleblower fund than that was set up for, for, by the IRS to, 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 to report tax fraud and other you know, maladies in, in, uh, in the tax code. But now, do you think that that the, the, that the SEC plans to raise that money in, in terms of maybe inciting more people, making more money available to pay off these whistleblowers? Well, right now there's a $400 million fund. Uh, they've just paid out $30 million uh, that was paid to an anonymous individual abroad. Uh, we don't, and the SEC hasn't even revealed the scheme that uh, the whistle was blowing on or the company, and that says to me that uh, this individual is probably going to receive future payouts uh, because there will be more enforcement actions and probably larger claims just for the single individual. Was there any singular event like the Bertie Madoff scandal that uh, created a need for this or was it cumulative? I, I think it's cumulative, but I mean, Bertie Madoff sort of tipped the scales. We had an Enron whistleblower. We had an FBI agent uh, saying, you know, these rates are impossible. These rates are impossible. Uh, and Bertie Madoff, unfortunately, was embedded in the SEC regulatory system uh, and ran a very sophisticated program. And that's exactly why we need whistleblowers, because these are sophisticated schemes by sophisticated players, high stakes. Now, this $30 million payment, the government hasn't named the scheme of the company involved, but can you give us the names of some of the other companies that have been uh, caught or have had to pay fines as a result of this whistleblower program? Sure. Uh, Citibank Mortgage, um, J.P. Morgan, uh, most of the big players. If you look at the SEC website, they will list 139 different uh, entities that have paid out, um, and that's how individuals can go to the web website and see where they may have a claim. Uh, if they brought uh, information to the let's, let's take a look at that list of those companies. Now, do those companies, if, do you anticipate or do you believe that some of those companies have actually put in fines as a part of doing business? Like, ah, we're going to still do this and we'll get caught and then we'll pay the fine. Well, I think that's been kind of the common understanding, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, that these fines for a long time have been simply a cost of doing business. They're earning billions of dollars on drugs. Same thing in the financial sector. It's for, until someone actually serves time and there's a criminal prosecution, you're going to see this as, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's about making money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the goal. That's the measure of achievement. And there's going to be a lot of pushing the envelope past where it should be pushed. And so I think, you know, mm -hmm. as a cultural matter, we're going to see this So then, continue. So then the, the next question, and we have about 30 seconds left, is, is it working? Is it, is it working to stem the tide of corruption in the banking industry? It's working to enable the SEC to do its job. The SEC has budget cuts. They absolutely need these people from the inside to get the good information and the evidence that they would otherwise never see. Robert Sadowski, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your insight. Thank you. Please come back. Well, ahead, how America's TV viewing habits are changing. Find out why and how retailers are capitalizing on the new behaviors. You're watching Arise Exchange. There is a reason Africa is called the new frontier. What was once potential is now an opportunity ready to be seized. Once revered for our resources, 
Today's wealth lies in our people. People who build the cities that shape the future. People who know an idea in one place means business in another. A generation for whom technology means there are no borders, no boundaries. We are the new lions in a brave new world. Kings of the urban jungle. And there's a bank that puts the world in our pocket and the future in our hands. UBA, Africa's global bank. Well, we all know that Americans like to watch a lot of TV. Well, an average of more than four hours a day is what they're watching, but the way they're watching is, in fact, changing. Bobby Ravel has this story. Americans are watching a ton of television programs, but fewer are watching them on a television. Online streaming is the new viewing medium, surging 60% this past quarter compared to a year ago, says a new report from Nielsen. Supersized smartphones helping drive eyeballs there, that was up about 25%. Traditional live TV, still big at more than four hours a day, but falling close to 4%. This trend could be very concerning to the big media players, says uh, S&P Capital uh, IQ's Tuna Amobi. If this scenario continues, then you have to wonder, you know, how much the networks are going to be able to make up this potential shortfall in advertising revenues, as well as even traditional syndication revenues. These are all multi-billion dollar industries which could be potentially at risk as more and more consumers gravitate to um, online video, you know, cord cutting, etc. That cord cutting is slicing the profits of pay TV. Nielsen says that group lost more than 2 million customers, and no surprise here, ratings continue to fall. And it is still unclear if the money they make licensing content to streaming services like Netflix is enough to make up for what they lose on advertising. This past year's upfronts, which is when the TV networks try to sell their ads ahead of time, was very weak. Media companies are now scrambling to reimagine their advertising models. I think, you know, what it's going to do is to, um, you know, put more pressure on, um, you know, the traditional media companies to, you know, um, leverage the digital advances and technology to be able to harness uh, this um, change in viewing habits uh, over, you know, uh, for example, addressable, address, addressable advertising is one area we think is going to be profoundly reshaped. Um, also, programmatic uh, buying, as you indicated. Uh, there's more and more effort to kind of leverage data on, on, on video consumption and monetize that in order to uh, be able to mitigate the declines. Nielsen recently said it is going to measure shows on streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime, which don't sell ads but now matter in how others value content. Well, the new Nielsen measurement plan is expected to begin measuring subscription-based television sometime in the beginning of next year. Well, coming up next here at Rise Exchange, even with record recalls in the auto industry, sales are still at all-time highs. You're watching a Rise Exchange. Apple unveiled new products today. Did it meet expectations? Apple stock is up 20%. The White House says it has proper measures to contain the spread of Ebola. This seems to be in some ways exploding. What are officials saying? We remain focused on working with our partners on the ground to stop the epidemic. Enhanced measures have been put in place in Africa and the United States. This is hitting home in a very real way and I think, yeah, we need to be concerned. Hello and welcome to Arise America. I'm Debbie Turner-Bell. Global. It's Monday, so it must be time for a new round of sanctions against Russia. Nigeria is open for business, and you are getting a handle on this situation. Compelling. Time for liquid lunch, things that make us want to drink. Could she have been separated at birth from, say, Grimace? All business. Money's coming out of these countries, and that flow is part of what's driving the equity markets. Entertaining money daily. It's about reimagining. Arise Exchange. 
Recalls, recalls, and more recalls. Analysts say it's the worst year on record, with one in five cars and trucks being called back in the U.S. with some risk or defect. So far, more than 50 million cars have been recalled with no end in sight. And according to experts, however, that despite the news, as we reported earlier, car sales continue to soar at all-time highs with an increase of more than 4% in sales this year alone. Here to make sense of it all is the car coach, Lauren Fix, who joins us by phone. Lauren, uh, so far about 14 million airbags have been recalled worldwide, but uh, every day more manufacturers are announcing some other kind of defects that they need to fix. How much is this costing the auto industry worldwide? Oh, it's definitely sucking up their profits. Uh, today we even had the new GM midsize Colorado and its GMC equivalent uh, received a recall notice for their airbags. Now, we're not sure if it's the same Takata airbags or not, but we do know that GM is being very cautious these days. If they think there's even a possibility, they're being very proactive, and it is costing them in profits, and you've seen no real growth in their stock either, and part of that is because of all the recalls. Now let's go to Takata. I mean, the company has essentially given uh, the U.S. Um, regulatory agency that oversees the auto industry the finger and telling them that they're not going to recall their products. Uh, how long do you think that Takata could sustain that, and will U.S. automakers put pressure on them to get their act together? Well, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, on Tuesday of last week said that, you know, we'd like to have a complete recall, uh, you know, of all airbags, both front side and, you know, driver and front side. There's three airbag uh, recalls in total. There's a front airbag, a passenger side front airbag, and a side impact driver's airbag. And uh, Takata said, we're not going to do it. We don't believe this makes sense. And this is rare that a manufacturer fights back in public. I'm sure it happens in private. But in public, it's rare. Uh, they said, no, we're, we're not going to do it. We can barely ke keep up with producing these as fast as we can, and manufacturers that compete with them cannot supply what's needed. So um, they're going to have to do what they have to do, they're claiming, and it's a back down, which tells me that they're just weak. Now, uh, speaking of weak, let's wheel to uh, GM's decision to close their Opal plant uh, overseas. Um, what's the future of this, these the so-called collaborations between U.S. and foreign automakers? GM has owned Opal for quite a while, and they are bleeding quite a bit of profits out of their European division. And because Opal is one of their lesser expensive lines, it makes more sense to shut down a production line or a facility and to help increase profit margins. And that's really what it always comes down to. And Opal has really taken a beating. It just has not had the sales that it hoped to. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, with Ford really making a strong uh, growth in Europe as well as Toyota and Honda and Nissan, uh, Opal had to really take a step back. In other auto news, it appears that Americans uh, seem to be behind on their auto payments despite record sales. What do you think is the main factor behind that? I think lenders are giving more money uh, to consumers that are actually in bad financial straits because obviously they want to sell cars. And we've seen record sales this year, and we're looking at 17 million vehicles, possibly 17.1. We won't know that to the end of this month. But looking at the lease payments and the purchase payments, those total costs of those vehicles has gone up. And because of that, the payments go along with it. You're finding that 36% of people that are being given loans or leases truthfully can't afford them. And they're already making late payments, and some as late as 60, 90 to 120 days. And this could actually impact not just the auto industry, mm -hmm. if, if all this explodes, that it also could affect banking. Yeah, it sounds very familiar. sounds very familiar to the housing bubble that burst uh, yes. just about eight years it's ago. Yes, happened before. Yes, yes mm, exactly. I've been here. Yeah, this is a dream. No, it's not. That's deja vu. Yes, exactly. Thank you so very much. The car coach, Lauren Fix, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Next week on Arise Exchange, with the holiday countdown on, are shoppers taking advantage of all those extended discounts and deals? Take another look at how the markets did for the week. A record close for the Dow. The S&P 500 also in the green. And the Nasdaq slightly down for the week. Uh, now, Andrew Schmertz will be taking his holiday vacation next week, so we won't be seeing him for a couple of days. But between myself and Julian Phillips, we'll make sure to keep you up to date on all the latest financial news. I'm Gary Anthony Ramsey. Thank you so much for watching Arise Exchange. I'll see you on Monday.